My overseas assignment is just one week away. At almost 50 years old, this will be my first time living abroad. I am very nervous about what the place will be like and whether I will be able to manage well. However, I am honestly worried about leaving my son, Daniel, and my husband, Sebastian, who is a homebody, behind while I go overseas. If possible, I would prefer to stay in the US, but that's not an option. Contrary to my feelings, Sebastian and Daniel don't seem to feel any sadness about my going overseas. They have always been understanding of my work, as I have been busy and away from home often. Feeling a bit of lingering attachment, I took off for the overseas assignment. While I was bewildered by the unfamiliar environment there, I concentrated on my work, always thinking of my family. After a few months, my work finally settled down, and I could see a return to THUS in sight. Finally, the day of my return arrived. I hurried home with a lot of souvenirs in my hands. I'm home. I opened the living room door, eagerly anticipating their reactions. What? A ghost? For a moment, I turned around, wondering who he was talking to, but Daniel's gaze was fixed on me. Is he saying that to me? Am I presumed dead? Feeling hurt, I quietly left the house. Later, the true meaning behind those words became clear. I was once a college student and also a company president. There was a time when I became the center of attention with such titles. I, Charlotte, started my own apparel brand while I was a college student and became a president at a young age. Ever since middle school, I dreamed of becoming a business owner and worked hard on my studies in high school to make that dream come true. My high school life was far from the glamorous one I had imagined, filled only with memories of studying and gathering information about business. When I think back on high school, the memory of homecoming stands out. I had no specific destination in mind and was walking aimlessly when I was drawn towards the sounds of excitement. It seemed like a stage set up by classmates for their band performance. Curious about who was performing, I peeked through the gaps in the crowd. As soon as I saw the person playing the guitar, my heart started pounding and I felt emotions I had never experienced before. This must be what they call love at first sight. From then on, whenever I saw him, I couldn't help but watch him without being noticed. However, with exams and studies approaching, I wasn't confident in my ability to balance academics and a love life. I hid my feelings and focused on achieving my big goal of starting my own business. Thanks to that, I was able to get into my desired university and steadily acquire the knowledge needed to run an apparel brand. Ever since I was a child, I had a tendency to become so absorbed in something that I would forget about everything else around me. Perhaps it was that trait that allowed me to start my business quickly. While attending university, I spent my days diligently managing my fledgling company. During that time, I received a new job offer. A band wanted to exclusively contract me to design their stage outfits. I never thought I'd be responsible for an artist's costumes. Wait, this name? As I checked the request form, a familiar name caught my eye. One of the members of the band was Sebastian, the guy from the homecoming band. Wow, you're still in a band. We ended up signing an exclusive contract, and as we began discussing costumes, I reunited with him. I can't believe we went to the same high school. It feels so familiar. Actually, I knew about you from the homecoming event, and I'm surprised we meet again like this. I look forward to working with you. We had several meetings, and the more we met the more my old feelings for him started to resurface. Eventually, we started going out for meals, and soon we found ourselves drawn to each other, beginning a romantic relationship. As my personal life blossomed, my company also started to gain momentum. His band, too, was gaining popularity and recognition. We were both at the peak of our careers. Charlotte, my work has stabilized. 
Shall we get married? After two years of dating, he brought up marriage. Of course, I want to get married. But I want to keep working. My career is just taking off. Let's support each other while valuing our work. If we cooperate, we can make it work. Thank you, that's really reassuring. I'm looking forward to it. And so, we got married. Despite being busy with work, we enjoyed a warm newlywed life. It made us happy to be able to do the jobs we loved while living together. In the midst of this, I found out I was pregnant. I have some news. What is it? Something about work? No. Sebastian, you're going to be a dad this summer. Really? I have to work even harder now. He smiled and finished his beer. I felt I had to work harder too. While feeling a mix of anxiety and anticipation about balancing parenting and work, I vowed to make our coming child happy. It's okay to come out now. Sebastian spoke to my belly. The season had fully turned to summer. We were eagerly awaiting the arrival of our baby. Having wrapped up my work in preparation for the birth, we were ready at any moment. A week later, a healthy baby boy was born. We named him Daniel. Taking care of a newborn was challenging in a different way from work, but it brought a different kind of joy. Even in the chaos, I found myself loving Daniel more each day as he grew. After a few months of maternity leave, I was able to return to work. I had been worried about the company while I was away, but it was running smoothly, which was a relief. Sebastian also helped with housework and child-rearing whenever he could, so I never had to struggle alone. We were blessed with both work and family, leading a perfectly smooth life. However, such happy days don't last forever. Lately, Sebastian had been home more often, with no work scheduled. Don't you have any plans today? No. Work has been slow lately. It'll get back to normal soon, though. If you say so. I hope it does. Sebastian didn't seem too concerned, but I was worried about his future work. Since that conversation, it felt like he was getting less work. I started to worry about the band's future. Soon, my fears were realized. Sebastian's band gradually lost its popularity, fading from public memory. Honestly, I panicked. With his work declining, I had to support both him and Daniel. With my current workload, it wasn't going to be enough. I needed to work harder and earn more. Feeling the duty to protect my family, I focused on my work more than ever before. Focusing on work was easy. However, I could hardly spend any time with my family. I wanted to watch young Daniel grow. But I needed to earn money. Torn between work and family, I threw myself into my job. While I was busy and couldn't focus on childcare, Sebastian handled his upbringing while managing his own limited work. I often worried about not being able to spend quality time with Daniel, but Sebastian's help was reassuring, and I was very grateful. Daniel gradually grew up, from elementary to middle school. Between work, I tried to participate in as many events as possible to feel Daniel's growth, which was all I could manage. Eventually, Daniel became a high school student and reached the time to decide his future. Daniel, it's up to you, but would you consider working at my company? I suggested to increase Daniel's career options. I can't think of anything I want to do, and finding a job is tough these days, so maybe I'll try working at mom's company. And so Daniel decided to join my company. It felt like a dream to be able to work with Daniel in my own company. But since he joined as the boss's son, employees would have high expectations of him. If he quickly learned the job, he'd be recognized by the employees, and Daniel would surely find it rewarding. I dedicated myself to training Daniel so he wouldn't struggle. One day, during a break, Daniel came to me and said, 
Why are you so strict with me? I can't learn everything all at once. Daniel, I'm not being strict just with you. I want you to learn quickly and make it easier for yourself. That's just your thinking. I want to learn at my own pace. He said and walked away. What I was doing to prevent Daniel from struggling had become a burden. Listening to Daniel's words made me reflect a bit. However, I became overly enthusiastic about teaching and often clashed with Daniel. Just as Daniel began to learn and manage his work, a problem arose. Sebastian's band finally got dropped by their agency. Sebastian, who had been in the band for years, looked like a shell of his former self. No wonder. Since he had lived with music since high school, saying he lost his purpose in life wasn't an exaggeration. I felt sorry for him, who had lost his purpose. I couldn't leave things as they were, so I wanted to offer Sebastian a lifeline. Hey Sebastian, you can't just do nothing, how about becoming an executive at my company? Honestly, I don't want to do anything right now. You'll need to do something eventually, so start getting back on your feet bit by bit. Yeah, I know. For now, try working at my company. Take it slow. So, Sebastian started working as an executive at my company. I hoped that having a social role would eventually help him recover and start a new chapter in life. But I would soon realize my thinking was naive. Hey, are you not planning to go to work today? I'm just not in the mood. Sebastian avoided going to work, making excuses every day and doing nothing. At first, I thought he was going through a tough time mentally and left him alone. But as this dragged on, I began to feel more and more frustrated with Sebastian. Sebastian, don't you think it's time to get over this? Staying at home won't help anything. I'll start working soon. Just wait a little longer. He said this, continuing his unchanging routine. Meanwhile, Daniel brought his fiance to introduce her to us. This is my fiance, Ella. We're planning to get married this year. Nice to meet you, I'm Ella. I really like the brand Charlotte's company represents. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Ella, please take good care of Daniel. Ella was a very personable woman. She and Daniel made a great couple. I realized that Daniel was starting his own family. He had grown into a responsible adult. While it felt a bit lonely that my child was growing up, the joy outweighed the sadness. Soon, we received the news that the wedding date was set. Mom, is your schedule clear? Make sure to keep the date open. Of course, I'm really looking forward to your wedding, Daniel. I was excited, wondering what kind of wedding it would be. Just then, a major project was starting to take shape at work. Really? Thank you so much. Our company had decided to expand its brand overseas. As part of this, we would be opening a branch office abroad. It seemed like things were going to get even busier. As I was pushing forward with the preparations for this major event, Daniel's wedding was now only a month away. I had something important to tell Daniel. I would have to go abroad for the new branch office one week before his wedding. Why did it have to overlap with the wedding? I desperately wanted to attend the wedding. I tried to coordinate with everyone involved to adjust the schedule. However, it wasn't something that could be changed just because of my personal circumstances. If I turned down this opportunity now, the chance to grow the company might not come again. Both Daniel's wedding and my job, which supports our livelihood, were equally important. But for the sake of a brighter future for Sebastian, Daniel, Ella, and their future children, I had to keep growing the company. As a last resort, I had to ask Daniel to accept that I wouldn't be able to attend his wedding because of my overseas assignment. Now was the time to tell him. I stopped Daniel as he was about to leave work. 
I need to apologize. I have to go overseas for the new branch office a week before your wedding, so I won't be able to attend. What? Why did you let the dates overlap? Couldn't you change it? I tried my best, but it couldn't be changed. I'm really sorry. You're missing my wedding. That's unbelievable. With that, he left. As tension lingered between Daniel and me, the day of my departure finally arrived. Daniel, I'm really sorry about the wedding. I'll do my best for you and Ella. Please take care of Dad. Yeah, okay. I guess work is more important. Daniel still seemed upset about my overseas assignment and spoke coldly. Meanwhile, Sebastian continued to stay home all the time. Would he be all right while I was abroad? Sebastian, I've informed the company about everything. Go in when you can. And I'm sorry I can't attend the wedding. Celebrate for me as well. Well, if it's for work, there's nothing that can be done. I'll try my best too. I made sure Sebastian had enough arrangements and financial support before heading overseas. It was my first time living abroad. My days were filled with work. Just when I started to get used to the local language and food. I wondered how Sebastian and Daniel were doing. How was the wedding? I refrained from contacting them so as not to disturb them due to the time difference so I didn't know how they were doing. But there were no emergency messages, so they must be doing fine. A few months later, I finally managed to wrap up my work and could return home. I was so happy that I could finally go back to my home. I felt so guilty for causing so much trouble for Sebastian and Daniel, so I decided to buy them lots of souvenirs. I wondered what Ella would like. Thinking about my family, I circled the souvenir shop three times. The long flight made me tired, but as soon as I arrived in America, my fatigue vanished. I hurried to my home and opened the door. I'm home. Sebastian and Daniel were in the living room. I'm sorry for causing so much trouble for both of you. My work has settled down, so I could come back. Their reaction was not what I expected. What? A ghost? Mom is still alive? Yeah, it looks like it. What kind of joke is this? Stop it. I never imagined being treated like a deceased person. I was bewildered by their unexpected words. Can you tell me what happened while I was gone? Huh? Someone who didn't attend my wedding isn't family. There's nothing to talk about. I really feel sorry about that. But I was trying to work hard for the family. I don't want to hear those excuses. Stay overseas forever. I can manage the company here without you. I couldn't take Daniel's words and turn to Sebastian for help. Hey, Sebastian, isn't that too harsh? Say something too. No, everything Daniel said is true. You're no longer part of this family. I was deeply shocked. I never thought I'd hear such words from my family. Maybe I focused too much on my work? Of course. No mom in the world would miss her son's wedding for work. I decided to wait a little while before talking to them again. I quietly left the house and decided to stay at a motel for a while. A few days later, I thought I might try to talk to them again and headed to the house. When I entered the house, it seemed that Sebastian and Daniel were out. But it seemed like Ella was there, and I could hear a faint voice from the living room. She seemed to be talking to someone on the phone. As I quietly entered the living room not to disturb her, I heard my name in the conversation. But, you know, Charlotte is really pitiful. She's been abandoned by her family, and now she's about to lose her company. I got a copy of that file. So, what's my next move? 
Listening carefully, it seemed like they were talking about taking over my company. I heard that Ella joined my company after I returned to the US, but what does it mean to take over? And who was she talking to on the phone? I was shocked to think that Ella could be plotting such a thing. I started this company young, entrusting my dreams to it. I worked hard for my goals, but at some point, I started striving to grow the company for my family. I couldn't let Ella take over such an important company. I thought about what I could do to protect the company and hired a detective to investigate Ella. A few days later, the detective contacted me, saying they had gathered information on Ella quickly. Where should I start? The detective opened his mouth cautiously. Charlotte, do you know this person? Oh, this person. In the picture he showed me, the president of the rival company was there. It seems this person is involved. For now, let me report my findings. I think it's best if you tell your family as well. But I can't just go home so easily. Neither my husband nor my son talk to me much. Please, just go ahead with the report. In that case, I'll be present when you tell your family. I'll speak up if necessary. Now, let's start with the findings on her. The detective began speaking calmly. With each report the detective made, the furrow in my brow deepened. So that's what Ella's phone call was about. I have to talk to my family about this. Hearing the investigation results and learning the truth, I decided to confront Ella. I enlisted the detective's help again and gathered all the evidence. I prepared thoroughly for the confrontation. The detective was by my side. I couldn't afford to lose here. I took a deep breath and opened the front door. I have something to talk about. Everyone, please sit down. I gathered Sebastian, Daniel, and Ella in the living room. Sorry for the suddenness. This is a detective I hired. I had him investigate something. Ella, do you have any idea what it might be? What? No, I don't. Did I do something? Ella responded with a laugh. Why are you doing this, Mom? You haven't even seen Ella that much. Is there a problem? Daniel defended Ella and directed his hostility at me. Sebastian, trying to grasp what was happening, listened in silence with a worried expression. Ella, you know this person, don't you? I placed the photo of the rival company's president walking beside a smiling woman. As soon as Ella looked at the photo, she tried to cover it with her hand, but I quickly picked it up. Hey, let me see that. Sebastian, Daniel. You've been deceived by her. What are you talking about? That's disrespectful to Ella. That's right. I would never deceive anyone. What are you saying, Charlotte? Ella said mockingly. Daniel, look. The woman next to this man is Ella. And this man is the president of the rival company, Ella's former lover. It seems she's colluding with him to take over the company. Stop making things up. Stop saying such nonsense. Enough already. Daniel still didn't believe me. Feeling secure with Daniel on her side, Ella remained calm and composed. Marrying you was part of her plan too. Daniel, wake up and see the reality. Why should I believe that? You are hardly ever home, Mom. You have no right to say this. You were always working and never paid attention to me. Daniel refused to listen to me and vented his long-held frustrations. I couldn't just brush off his words. I had worked so hard to make Daniel happy, but it had backfired. Had I really made Daniel feel so lonely? Dad's income was always unstable, so I felt I had to step up. I wanted to make sure you lived comfortably but I was wrong. 
Daniel, I'm sorry for making you feel so lonely all these years. That's just an excuse. He muttered, his face slightly contorted. Sorry to interrupt this touching moment, but can you stop making me the villain? When is this going to end? Ella sneered, her words dripping with contempt. Even at this point, she was still trying to hide her true nature. Detective, clearly frustrated by Ella's attitude, spread out photos and documents on the table as evidence. Do you still claim ignorance even after seeing this? What is this? Daniel, don't look at it. This is nonsense. Don't look. Ella screamed, frantically trying to gather the scattered items on the table. But Ella's desperate cries were in vain as Sebastian and Daniel began to examine the evidence one by one. Is what mom's saying true? Ella, you. Man, with evidence like this, there's no way we can win. Realizing she was at a disadvantage, Ella slumped onto the sofa in defeat. Was it really only for the company? Was your desire to become part of our family a lie? Daniel's voice was filled with despair as he questioned her. Yes, I planned to divorce as soon as I took over the company. The boss said everything would go smoothly if I did what he told me. Why did it have to be discovered at such a crucial moment? I'm not to blame. She raised her voice, refusing to acknowledge her wrongdoing. Feeling uncomfortable, she hurried outside, likely to call her boss or someone else. Do you believe me now? Yes. I was completely deceived. Then I will take my leave. The detective began to pack up to leave. Thank you for your assistance. You have been a great support. I plan to have a long talk with my family now. I'm glad I could help. I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. With those words, the detective walked away briskly. As I watched the detective's retreating figure, I pondered what to say to Sebastian and Daniel next. They believed Ella's misdeeds, but there was still tension between us. For now, I decided to talk face to face. Taking a deep breath, I slowly returned to the living room. When I quietly opened the door, I saw Daniel looking dazed and Sebastian with his head bowed. Both of you, I'm sorry for the sudden shock today. I really want to talk and get back to being a family again. Sebastian, who had been hanging his head, finally spoke. Charlotte, Daniel. It's all my fault. Charlotte has been working so hard for Daniel, and I've only been doing what I wanted. I never thought about the family. But Sebastian, you took care of Daniel. Because of that, I was able to focus on my work. Even when my band fell apart, Charlotte had to endure the hardship. All I've ever done is music, so when it ended, I was completely lost. I knew Charlotte was trying to help me get back on my feet, but I couldn't do anything other than music, so I couldn't bring myself to do anything else. I'm truly sorry for all the trouble I've caused. Listening to our conversation, Daniel's eyes welled up with tears. Daniel, why do you look like you're about to cry? I've been working a lot, but that doesn't mean I was neglecting you. Please understand that. I've been resenting mom without knowing the whole story. Since I was little, I thought work was more important to mom than I was, and I was sulking about it. Mom, thank you for everything you've done for us. I'm sorry for the harsh things I've said. No, it's okay. I'm just happy we can finally talk like this. For the first time, the three of us were able to speak honestly with each other. It felt like our emotional distance had shortened a bit after we revealed our true feelings to each other. After some time, Daniel decided to divorce Ella. At the same time, Ella was fired from her job, and her plan to take over my company ended in failure. 
Daniel said he didn't want to have anything to do with her anymore, so he cut ties with her without demanding any alimony in the divorce court. As for Sebastian, he has been working hard as an executive in my company. I never thought I could still work at this age. I guess I've still got it. You're saying that just to sound impressive. I'm counting on you, you know. I was happy to see Sebastian looking so lively. It was a relief to know he found a place for himself outside the band. Hey, Mom. The sales from the overseas branch are incredible. Our international expansion is a huge success. Daniel excitedly showed me the product from my company that was making waves abroad. Wow. This is amazing. I've never seen numbers like this before. The overseas branch achieved remarkable results, and my company went public. It grew into a brand so formidable that our competitors couldn't catch up. By now, the president of that rival company and Ella must be biting their lips in frustration. The three of us gradually repaired our family relationships and worked together to manage the company. Balancing work and family was really tough. When Sebastian and Daniel turned their backs on me, it was even tougher, but it's a good memory now. What I feel most is a sense of accomplishment for having come this far. I plan to cherish this company and my family for a long time to come. Madison, did you get a good night's sleep? Yeah, she had such a silly sleeping face. Probably won't wake up till tomorrow. I felt dizzy at the sound of the familiar voice. In the hotel lobby, clinging to my husband Kevin's arm without a care in the world was my friend Grace. What do you want to do, Madison? At those words from my friend Thomas. I want to give those two a taste of their own medicine. I blurted out. I thought it was a mean answer, but Thomas on the phone laughed. I am Madison. 24 years old. A banker, having started working at a local bank after graduating from college. I've always been told I have a plain personality, not very adaptable, which turned out to be convenient for a career in banking. I never talk about clients' secrets, and I hardly have friends to talk about work with. Even if my family suggested it would be okay to share a little, I never did. I've never gotten along well with my family. I remember being left home alone often as a child, spending nights by myself since I was in first grade. My parents were busy with work, but they often said things like I was unsociable, wondering who I took after. They were both social, and it seemed they couldn't understand their introverted daughter. So, I don't have memories of being taken anywhere by my parents or receiving anything from them. When I came home, there was usually $10 left for me, which was supposed to last for about two days. That amount didn't change until I went to college, leading to nights when I couldn't sleep because of hunger. Grace's parents, who lived next door, often took pity on me and treated me to meals. Grace, unlike me, was affable, and when she met my parents, we wish Grace was our daughter. They would say things like, on the other hand, Grace's parents took good care of me. They noticed I was always alone and invited me over to their house, making me. And Grace, who was in the same grade, acquainted, eventually becoming something like childhood friends. However, Grace was a friend but often treated me poorly. It's because you're eating at my dad and mom's, she would say. Or looked down on me. Grace's dad owned an advertising agency, making Grace quite the company president's daughter. She always boasted about it, calling my family poor when my parents weren't around. Even when Grace's family went on trips and brought back souvenirs like keychains, Grace would end up taking them back. Maybe Grace felt lonely because her parents paid attention to other kids. At the time, I vaguely thought this while enduring her behavior. I knew well the pain of feeling neglected by one's family. Of course, Grace's parents did pay attention to her, but she must have had her own issues. Thinking this, 
I couldn't bring myself to retaliate against Grace's demeaning attitude. It was completely unexpected for me to get married. I hardly had any relationships with men, and the only male friend I could think of was Thomas, whom I met in high school. He wasn't a romantic interest, but rather an equal friend. My marriage was orchestrated by my parents, concerned that I didn't have a boyfriend. One day, out of the blue. You'll have a matchmaking date with a son of someone we know. I was shocked. Despite having no men in my life, I was still in my early twenties. It seemed too hasty. When I protested to my mom, you're not charming or cute, so a love marriage is impossible for you. Be grateful we're introducing you. She said. And Madison always looks so grumpy. At least have some cute kids. My dad added. I had no allies. However, if asked whether there was a chance for me to marry while continuing my job, honestly, there might not be. Maybe this was fate. With that thought, I accepted the matchmaking. The partner was Kevin, a company employee about five years older than me. He was a creator at an advertising company. Exactly the kind of socially adept person my parents would like. I thought matchmaking usually ended with now, it's up to the two young people, but my parents kept talking to him throughout. His parents excused themselves to give us space. If you're okay with a girl as unsociable as her, please take her. Oh, Madison is very attractive. Kevin nodded at dad's words and said that to me. It was the first time a man had called me attractive, and I was purely happy. However, the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with Kevin never came, and our marriage was decided in a somewhat haphazard manner. I think it ended up being similar to how my parents got married, but I still hoped we could get along well from here on. Once we started living together, Kevin turned out to be someone who could enjoy anything. Radiating a brilliant aura that was the exact opposite of mine. He was a bit extravagant with money, but he earned enough to make it no issue and was always kind to me. For someone like me, who hadn't been loved much by my parents, this was very gratifying. Let's go to Australia for our honeymoon, maybe. He suggested this to me, who had hardly ever left our hometown, a bit forcefully, but it made me feel glad I married him. Yet, I had worries. It was about Grace. Kevin and I had started living together near my childhood home, and it turned out Kevin and Grace were colleagues at work. To be precise, Grace was the secretary to Kevin's boss. Since we went to different universities, I didn't know where she ended up working, but it turned out she had taken a job at my dad's company. And then, Grace started visiting our new home frequently. Kevin, Grace, and I. It was obvious where the conversation would flow smoothly whenever the three of us were together. I couldn't keep up with the work talk, so I relegated myself to making snacks and such. Even though I thought I had cut ties with Grace after graduating, I never imagined we'd meet again like this. But now, I'm independent. I'm not the skinny girl who couldn't stand up to Grace anymore. Kevin must be happy to talk about work. With my bank job becoming busy, I didn't try too hard to stop Grace from visiting, hoping she might fill in for my absence and alleviate Kevin's loneliness. Madison, hurry up with the next snack, will you? Grace's attitude was poor, but I had gotten used to it. All right, all right. And would serve the snacks. I was a bit dissatisfied that Kevin didn't speak up about the awkward relationship between Grace and me. Deep down. That's no way to behave. I wanted him to tell Grace. But Kevin would just say, Thank you. And return to his conversation with Grace after eating the snack. We were married and already in such a situation, but we had planned a belated honeymoon for next week. Spending time alone, I hoped, would deepen our relationship. I was optimistic about it. Unaware that I was mistaken. Australia, 
where we went for our honeymoon, was wonderful. Cliché as it sounds, the endless blue skies and seas were a sight I could gaze at forever. And I watched Kevin frolicking with a sense of awe. Just as I had hoped, spending time together deepened our bond. We talked a lot, shared meals, and got to know each other better while resting in the hotel. Though we had some differences in opinion, it seemed like we could make it work. That's what I thought, just before it happened. Something that shouldn't happen on a honeymoon did. It was on the third night of our honeymoon. We decided to head back to the hotel early, agreeing with Kevin's suggestion. Usually, Kevin would ask me to make coffee, but unusually. Today, I'll make it. He used the hotel's facilities to make us instant coffee, simple but thoughtful. I felt our bond strengthening even in such moments. As I cheerfully accepted the coffee and drank about half, I noticed a strange taste and peeked into the cup, startled. I wanted to pat myself on the back for not drinking it all. At the bottom of the cup, I could see something white had settled. What's wrong, Madison? Kevin, who made the coffee, asked. Uh, nothing. I replied pretending to drink before seizing the chance to pour it down the sink. I was full of inner turmoil. Could Kevin have drugged the coffee? I didn't want to think so, but I couldn't help but suspect it. Perhaps as evidence, I soon felt a wave of drowsiness so intense it was unsettling. However, since I hadn't drunk at all, I didn't completely fall asleep. Doubtful of Kevin, I decided to pretend to sleep. Sorry, I guess I'm just tired. I'm really sleepy, so I'm going to bed. After saying that, I lay down in bed. Then, after a while, Kevin came over to check if I was sleeping. Pretending to be asleep consistently, I noticed Kevin quietly moving around the room before he opened the door and left. I got up as soon as the door closed. It must have been a sleeping pill he gave me earlier. So, Kevin was going somewhere he felt he needed to put me to sleep for. It was easy to imagine it wasn't for anything good. And then, a face flashed through my mind. Grace. I had no proof. But there were times I felt an atmosphere between them that was more than just colleagues. I thought it was my imagination, but maybe. But it was hard to believe Grace would follow us to Australia. But if not, then why? Confused, I changed my clothes and went outside immediately. Asking the hotel staff, I learned he had taken a taxi to a different hotel. I got the location of that hotel and took a taxi there myself. Please hurry. What's going on, ma'am? The taxi driver, seeing my urgent expression, must have sensed something was wrong. He asked once, but then silently drove on, parking a bit away from the hotel. Can you wait for me here, please? After he agreed, I approached the hotel with my mobile phone in hand. It seemed to be a lower grade than where we were staying, but was a decent hotel nonetheless. I rushed here, but I wondered if Kevin was still in the lobby. Just when I started to feel anxious. Kevin, you're late. Sorry, that took longer to kick in than I thought. Was Madison sleeping soundly? Yeah, she had the silliest sleeping face. She won't be waking up till tomorrow, I bet. Hearing a familiar voice made me dizzy. There, in the hotel lobby, without caring who saw, Grace was clinging to Kevin's arm. I quickly activated my camera and took several photos. They even started kissing, so I captured that too. Then, following them as they seemed to be heading for check-in, I casually sat near the front desk and turned on my voice recorder. Reservation for two under Kevin, Grace, correct? Yes, that's fine. Are you here on a couple's trip? Yes, we are. The words recorded on the voice recorder made me almost want to laugh. What couple? Kevin was hugging Grace's shoulder with a downtrodden look. I captured their cozy walk to their room in photos and returned to the taxi. 
the driver didn't ask anything and took me back to our hotel. I was crying by then, he must have realized something had happened. But these were not tears of sadness, but of frustration. I had been looked down upon by Grace for so long, had things taken from me. And just when I thought I was free, she was taking my husband too. Just thinking about Kevin hugging Grace made me nauseous. I had no more feelings for that man. It might disgrace my parents, but I didn't care. I was going to get my revenge, thoroughly. But how, exactly? I returned to my hotel room and tried to think, but I was probably still too shaken. I couldn't come up with anything. Just then, my mobile phone vibrated. It was Thomas, a friend from high school. How's the honeymoon? His simple message made me feel even more miserable and ready to cry. Thomas and I became friends in high school when we were on the same committee. While people tended to drift away from me because of Grace's disdain, Thomas never cared about what Grace said and treated me normally. We ended up going to the same university, deepening our connection. And even though we were in different departments, we went out for drinks a few times. He was the only one I could honestly vent to about Grace. Now receiving a message from Thomas. I found myself calling him and, as soon as he answered, what should I do? I asked in a tearful voice. What's wrong, did you and your husband have a fight? Thomas responded without annoyance to my sudden call. I poured out everything to Thomas, who had a generous attitude. He was speechless for a while, shocked by what I told him. I couldn't believe what was happening myself. Grace. I didn't know she was capable of going that far. Thomas didn't like Grace because she was always badmouthing people and had sympathized with me when I complained. I never thought it would come to this, but it's undeniable. So, what do you think I should do? What do you want to do, Madison? To that question, I want to make those two pay. I instinctively replied. Even though I thought it was a mean response, Thomas laughed on the other end of the phone. I was hoping you'd say that. I'll help if you want. Why don't you just leave them be and come back? I nodded to that and quickly packed my bags. Then, Kevin's passport and wallet appeared. He mentioned splitting wallets into one for essential items and another that could be lost while traveling. This was the important wallet. I put it into my luggage and also neatly arranged Kevin's belongings. I'll contact you again when I get back. I said. Understood. I'll help with whatever you need. And Thomas responded. Certainly, I may be unsociable, introverted, and inflexible. But that doesn't mean I deserve this treatment. I'm going to make sure they get what they deserve. With that vow, I checked out with luggage for two. I made sure to lock the carry-on case and put it into my luggage, then left it at the airport's storage. Boarding the plane with just my belongings. Thomas. If you've done all that, they won't be able to come back for a while, so take a rest today. Messaged me. Following his advice, I went straight to sleep upon reaching home. Ensuring my phone was off to avoid any calls from Kevin. The next day. My phone was flooded with missed calls, as expected. I ignored them for a while but answered when Kevin called again. Madison, where are you now? Oh, I'm at home. I rushed back because a friend seemed to have been in an accident. I couldn't reach your phone. I had left several missed calls on his phone while packing at the hotel, thinking it would be off. That seemed to convince Kevin for the moment. Where did my luggage go? Why did you check out without me? I thought it was too expensive for just the two of them to stay in that room if I was leaving alone. Oh, I left your luggage at the airport storage. I know, I got a notification. But I can't find the keys to the carry-on. How am I supposed to get my passport and wallet out? I didn't lock the carry-on. Maybe the zipper broke? 
By the way, where were you that day? You didn't even answer your phone. With that, Kevin fell silent. Of course, he did. He couldn't honestly answer because he was up to no good. Well, I had to step out for a bit. Anyway, I have to visit my friend in the hospital, so I'll hang up now. Bye. Wait a. I hung up without waiting. The keys to the carry-on aren't that complicated. Even if he manages to open it, there won't be a passport or wallet inside. It'll take time, but he can have them reissued and isn't stranded forever. I focused on my preparations until Kevin's return. When Kevin came back, I called him to the house. He called me upon seeing the empty new house. Why is there nothing in the room? Where are you? Well, you'll find out if you come here. I'm at my parents' house now. I hung up after saying that. Soon, I heard a car stop in front of the house. It's been a while. I led Kevin to the living room with an innocent expression. Kevin followed, his face turning red. You're going to explain this, right? The passport and wallet, it was all you're doing? Explanation? Of course, I'll give you one. I opened the door to the living room. There, Thomas, my parents, Grace's parents and Grace, along with Kevin's parents, were present. Their expressions varied, with Kevin's parents looking particularly pale. What's all this about, everyone here? So, you're Kevin? Nice to meet you. Thomas addressed Kevin. Who are you? Kevin asked Thomas with a look of displeasure. Just a friend of Madison's. Thomas replied succinctly. Then, he handed Kevin some documents. What's this? Kevin's complexion worsened gradually. Thomas. You know what it is. Then said. Evidence that you've been plagiarizing designs. I was shocked at how much stuff came out when I went through your computer. Kevin, while being a creator at an advertising agency, had been secretly plagiarizing others' ads. Programmer Thomas, who is knowledgeable about computers, quickly cracked the password and took a look inside. It seems that Grace's dad, the president of Kevin's company, was furious about this behavior. Naturally. It's a matter related to the company's reputation. Can't believe you'd tarnish our company's name like this. At those words, Kevin turned pale. Adding to that, I laid out photos on the reception room's desk. Photos of Kevin and Grace meeting at a hotel, kissing, heading to a room together, and finally. I played their conversation at the time on a mobile phone. So, you sent Grace home early to avoid getting caught. Grace seemed a bit more tanned than before. Her well-tanned skin would be good evidence of her traveling. She looked sulky as if saying this has nothing to do with her. Kevin, what on earth are you doing? Finally, unable to hold back, Kevin's dad raised his voice. Next to him, Kevin's mom looked at her son as if she couldn't believe it. Grace, you too! This time, Grace's mom scolded Grace. Grace, who had been fiddling with her mobile phone, finally looked up. There was no sign of remorse on her face. Instead, her usual condescending expression as if to say it was our fault. What's the big deal? It's all because Madison is plain and poor, right? It was Kevin who hit on me first, why should I be the one getting scolded? Such a defiant attitude. Almost admirable in its audacity. That's when my parents intervened. They seemed carefree and not at all angry. Well, well, they're young, and Kevin could make mistakes. Look, Grace is pretty and comes from a wealthy family. Yeah. Our daughter isn't charming or cute and being cheated on, well. I was speechless. Could real parents say such a thing? Then Thomas stood in front of my parents and said coldly. What do you think you're doing to your own daughter? There's no reason she should be okay with being cheated on. 
following up like a counterattack, were Grace's parents. Grace's dad put his hand on my shoulder and looked at my parents. I don't want to meddle in other families' affairs, but Madison is a very good girl. Just as he said, there's no reason she should be okay with being cheated on. It seems you're quite fond of Grace, but where did you go wrong in education to mess with someone else's husband? Grace's mom also looked at Grace while saying this. I found myself in a position being protected by these three and couldn't help but feel like crying. Kevin's mom came over to apologize deeply. I don't know how to properly apologize to Madison. Of course, we'll go through with a divorce and pay any amount of compensation. Ha, huh, divorce? Compensation? Kevin explained in surprise. Where was the surprise in all this? I'm not the kind of person who can quietly endure being cheated on during a honeymoon. Grace, you're paying too. Why should I? I wasn't the one who had an affair, it has nothing to do with me. Grace screamed. Then Kevin. Are you planning to abandon me? He yelled, and the scene was a mess. Eventually, Kevin's parents made him write a divorce application, and a meeting with a lawyer was set for a later date. Of course, Grace was also involved. I decided to demand a hefty compensation. Kevin was naturally fired from his job and seems to be facing lawsuits from other companies. Grace also, as her involvement with Kevin spread within the company, couldn't continue her work as a secretary and quit. As for me, I ended up marrying Thomas. Marrying without a dating period for the second time. I never thought I would do something like this in such a short span. I've always liked you. I thought it would be okay as long as you were happy, even if it wasn't with me. But if you're going to get caught by such a man again, why not marry me? Hearing this, I nodded, albeit confused. It was the same as with Kevin, no dating period, but I've known Thomas since high school and am well aware of his character. I didn't think he had romantic feelings for me, but when he confessed, I felt thrilled, so I'm sure I can fall in love with him. After that, I decided to cut ties with my biological parents and Grace. I hadn't been receiving any support from them anyway, and I didn't want to associate with people who would insult me in that situation. Instead, Grace's parents. Even though we're like this, you can think of us as your parents if you want. Said. Kevin's parents also cared about me and kept in touch, calling me often, and we still have a relationship. I never want to see Kevin or Grace again, and I have no intention of doing so. Cutting ties with my parents and Grace, I finally felt free. And I felt confident that my life from now on would surely be much better.